So simply having diversity is not enough. Diversity has to be leveraged through inclusion. The extent to which individuals feel valued and included by an organization. It is the end game. The demographic diversity is only a visible lead indicator, but the thought is what the end game is. And there's several examples of this, but I love pulling stuff from Deloitte because they have been re-examining this business case for diversity. And they've been going out selling this product to a whole bunch of people who take it in, but we already know this. We already know that when you bring in people with diversity of thought, you see a significant increase in your outcomes. And it's because you add in innovation and creativity. This was published in 2013 in Association of Medical College and Academic Medicine. And what they showed was the relationship between the student body, racial and ethnic diversity, and the mean level of student agreement and statements about their learning from students in the classroom with them from different backgrounds. And you can see significant increase in how they learn if the people were more dissimilar to them. Again, the richness of the solution. I would just end with this part on diversity. It has to be a factor in your recruiting. You gotta have more people in leadership ability, all of us in leadership roles who are diverse because role modeling and mentorship matters. When I go to a boardroom and I'm the only woman, Clearly, I still feel isolated, even in the position that I sit. If I go to a boardroom and I'm the only African-American person there, I feel the same isolation as a student does when they walk into a room and they see all of the leadership or all of their professors or everybody in the classroom look differently but the same than them. And so that isolation and those feelings of insecurity do not go away with age, believe me but they can be tempered by bringing other people to the table. Now, disparities also demand that we change. And I always look at it this way. One of the, one of the challenges that we see clearly in the South and some other areas, looking at rural versus urban, we see that 20% of Americans live in rural areas and only 9% of physicians practice in rural areas. We see that just based on where people live, rural residents are less likely to have health insurance, have fewer doctor visits, preventive tests. They have higher rates of COPD, diabetes, and heart disease. We can see the same thing with gender. Compared to men and women, lower incomes to pay for health care. It is amazing to me that we are still having these conversations about women making 70 some cents on a dollar as compared to men. I cannot believe we're still having these conversations. Higher rates of poverty, higher rates of chronic health disease, and clearly more poverty rates. So this is a fundamental graph of public health. And on the x-axis you have socioeconomic status going from low to high. And then on the y you have health. So there are lots of different things that you can do as a nation to increase the health of a community without changing people's lower socioeconomic status. Immunizations, putting fluoride in the water, okay? All of those things made a difference in improving the health of the nation, but you didn't necessarily improve a person's socioeconomic status. There are lots of things you can do from a social perspective though that I believe you can move in both directions. If you have mentoring programs for inner city high school kids, if you improve the antibodies to prevent infection at the surgery, if you develop a scholarship program to increase opportunities for low-income students to go to college, if you have ethnic diversity training for primary care physicians, what you will find is that you improve not only people's health, but you actually begin to have people move up the slope of that line. So let's take these young men here, ninth grade. How do we get them to be here, graduates at Morehouse College? 
First of all, we have to understand where a lot of people come from. 36% of black children live in poverty. 35% of black children live in households described as food insecure. 38% of black children live in households where parents lack stable employment children have a mother with a less than a high school education. And more than 75% of black children between 1985 and 2000 grew up in high disadvantaged neighborhoods. So let's just say that that impacted 40% of these young men and we wanted to get them to this. How would we do that and why would it matter if we did that? So let's look, children in single parent families in the United States by income. This is in 2011, 52% would describe themselves as low income, 18% would say they were above low income. Let's look at national graduation rates for boys, 2009. First of all, in this country, again, it's kind of like the obesity thing. 69% graduation rates for all males, give me a break. How can you be the richest country in the world and not have above a 95% graduation rate. And the 5% all to just be Bill Gates and just didn't want to go to high school, okay? But other than that, this is, this, is, this is shameful. We should be shame about this as a nation. 76.1% for white students, 51.9% for African American, 58.1% for Hispanic. We ought to be embarrassed about this as the richest nation in the world. When you look at the national graduation rate, we have moved the needle. And you can look at the glass half full, which I usually do. 52% of black males in 2009, 58% of Latino males graduated from high school, 78% of whites. So we did increase on average by about 6%. But that means that we still have a lot of people not in the fold that need to be in the fold. At this rate, it would take another 50 years to close the, to close the gap, the achievement gap between black males and whites and non-Hispanic, non-Latino males. I don't think we have 50 years to get there. The parents' education matters. When you look at 1992 high school graduates, according to their parents' highest level of education, you can see that the highest rate was from who had parents that had some level of college or vocation and technical school or then a bachelor's degree and then a high school diploma. And when you look at, based on the parents' exposure to math, okay, and love of education, you can see that as the parents advance academically, you see a higher percentage of the kids graduated. But kids who didn't have math in their family, look at their high school graduation rates, okay? Math matters. Math, then you know that was, I always tell my son, you know, that ability to do those 100 problems in five minutes mattered, okay? And so math being exposed matters. And we see the same thing whether you look by race and ethnicity or family income, it's an impact. So the data is hard to argue with that the well-offness of the parents seems to have a powerful impact on the chance of the poverty of a child. So what that means to me is that yes, we can train and educate these students and we can do a good job of it. But we also have to go back into the community if we're really gonna make a difference and begin to impact the parents. One of the things that we started at Morehouse School of Medicine is that the Satcher Health Leadership Institute is a parenting program. And we graduate probably about 60 parents a year. And we wanna expand it to double that. And we teach them about parenting. We teach them math. We help with their reading skills. Most of them have a high school diploma. But we recognize the impact of what happens when you are two and three and you read to your child, or you're able to do those 100 math problems in five minutes. Now, why would a medical school be focused on that? Because we're trying to create health equity. And we think one of the ways to create health equity is how we engage and educate our community. It's just one of our tentacles. Black male success in higher education, what works? Messaging, mentoring, monitoring, ministering, and money. Okay, that's what works, the five M's, okay? You can show 
that when you provide mentoring, there's a pipeline and it always deals with your peers. You got to have people engage and you got to monitor. Why is this relevant to us primarily as a medical school? Because black male applicants are still in decline. When you look at the data from 2009, 2011, you can see the, we had an increase in the number of people applying to medical school. The only demographic that we saw decrease was African-American men. That was the only one that we saw decrease. I share this with you though because I know that you all, as many schools, are challenged about how do we recruit underrepresented minorities? And then what do we do for them when they get here? Are they going to be successful? This is the data uh, from the last couple of years that look at black acceptees and uh, black applicants, okay? And what you can see here is that at Morehouse School of Medicine, on average, intentionally, we take an average MCAT score of 27. We give we have 78 students. We, this year we got 5,217 applications. We could take everybody with a 4.0, 3.8 to 4.0, MCAT above 30 if we wanted to. It may not be the student though who aligns with our mission. We are committed to addressing the health professional shortage, diversifying the healthcare workforce, eliminating health disparities, and moving towards health equity. So we look for academically holistic, diverse students who are going to help us do that. And this is where their MCAT scores fall. We do a holistic interviewing process, and we don't have any challenges with it. We know, though, that last year in this country, that there were about 1,000 applicants who were African American, who had MCAT scores of 27, who did not get into medical school anywhere. And this is some data I just got the AAMC to give me. And this is looking at the U.S. medical applicants by race and ethnicity from 1980 to 2012. You can look at in 1980, there were 2,500 African Americans who applied to medical school. In 2012, it's 3,300. In Hispanics, there were 1,764. And you can see, 30, excuse me, 3,700 on that one. So you can see almost a doubling. When you look at the American Indian, 156 in 1980, but now we're down to 108. We're going backwards. When you look at the matriculants, okay, you got about a 30% chance you're gonna get into medical school. So 13,000 whites, 11,000 in 2012, African Americans, 999 in 1980, 1,182, so we increased over 22 years, or whatever, how many of years that is, by like 200 applicants, 200 people who are in our medical school. And again, look at the Native Americans. We went from 63 to 52. We're going a little bit backwards. When we look at black U.S. medical graduates by gender, you can see that in 1978, we had more African American men than African American women applying to medical school. But look at what's happening in 2012. The switch came in 1984. There are some systematic issues that have occurred between 1984 to 2007 that allow us not to have the pipeline of African American males applying to medical school. There are some systematic issues that are public health issues with our criminal justice system, and our preparation of these students for, medical, for uh, high school and even in middle school that has significantly decreased that pipeline. There's no way that you can have that many more African American women available to in the pipeline to apply as compared to men without understanding that we have some system issues. And then of course that translates to the matriculants. But this is the data that I really want to show you that I asked the AAMC because we're going to be having a, a symposium at our, our administrative retreat in April for the Council of Deans. When you look at, whether you look at whatever you look at at the GPA over here on the left-hand side, and you look at MCAT scores, and I'm just going to draw your attention to this MCAT range of 27 to 29. The four-year graduation rate for those students 
with a 3.80 or 3.20 is anywhere from 86 to 91 percent. And when you look at somebody who has an MCAT score of 36 to 38, guess what the on-time graduation rate is for four years? 89 to 87 percent. There's no statistical difference there. There's no statistical difference there. You can look at it for five year rates, five year. 27, 29, anywhere from 93 to 96%, depending on which GPA you look at. For kids who have 36, 38 GPAs, I mean MCAT scores, 97 to 96%. There's no statistical difference there. So I need for people to stop having this conversation about MCAT score being the determinant of whether or not people are going to be successful in medical school. In Georgia, we are a net exporter of black medical students. And let me show you a little bit of data, and I'll come back to this. Here is our entering MCAT score for 2013, and I showed it to you for 2014. Here are our students. Here are our students. Here's the nation. 100% pass rate on step one. 98% pass rate on step two, on step one that year is consistent. We always get 96 to 100% pass rate on the boards. And it's above that mean. And the reason for that is, is that we have what we call Morehouse School of Medicine magic. And you can have it too. It's just magic. It is how we mentor our students. It is how we provide a structured curriculum that really does allow them to have cumulative learning. And then the other M is how we monitor. So a lot of times people don't do well on tests because they don't do well on tests. And so you just have to have structure in place that help them to do better on a test. It does not mean that they don't know the information. And we have been able to consistently show that you identify those students early on and then you provide opportunities for their success. And it's pretty consistent in what we do. We also do a couple of things that really do allow us to have this pipeline. When I got to Morehouse School of Medicine in 2000, they had about 25 different pipeline programs. Nobody was monitoring them. Somebody got a grant, they started a pipeline program, and it stayed until somebody ran out of the grant. So we took all of our pipeline programs and I put them through an intensive evaluation program. And we ended up with these pipeline programs that touch students throughout their lives because we're trying to create a continuum. And wherever a student comes in here, they get a Morehouse School of Medicine email for life. So we now monitor and track them for life, sometimes with their parents' permission. <laughs> but we have outcomes. We have outcomes. I'm <laughs> We have outcomes for every one of these. And when we talk to people in the BN Carson program, we don't talk to them about being a doctor. We talk to them about getting through middle school and helping them with their science project and those different things. And so it's important. And there are programs that we are willing to share. So let me give you this last little bit. So this is me in the little red there. This is at my great my grandmother's house in Wrens, Georgia. Okay. And she lived on a farm. I grew up a lot of summers in the farm with her, and these are my other sisters. And what I tell you, that education does matter. Because I was raised in a single parent household, three sisters. My parents divorced when I was six. I did not have a strong relationship with my father. My mother worked at a paper factory. Swing shift, seven to three, three to 11, 11 to seven, for 25 years in order to raise her four daughters. And she told us that education was the equalizer. Born in rural Georgia, divorced single parent household, graduated from high school, Georgia Tech graduate, Harvard graduate, Emory residency, 10 years as associate professor, division head, professor chair, and now the president. And I am thoroughly convinced that education was, allowed, was what allowed me to move up this. It changed my socioeconomic status and it improved my health because I had more choices. So if we know this, what should we do? We must act. Someone said this about Ruth. She's a consummate idealist and realist. She will create the vision, lead the effort, and celebrate the reform. And that's what we have to do. There is nobody else. 
I always tell people we are the ones that we are looking for, so stop looking behind you. There is nobody else. You are the person who must lead, and she did that. So thank you so much for this opportunity. students, we, we have mandatory attendance and about 80 to 90 percent of them. They do social activities, but they do a lot of also, that's where we bring in a lot of ethical discussions. They can have about 50 percent of the time students select who they want to bring in as outside speakers to speak to them in their small group settings. So we do it through learning communities. We have a learning community for our MPH program, our, our, each of our different masters for our PhD. We've started one for women in medicine. Uh, and so we have it for different different groups. And we now have just started our alumni learning community. So we know where all of our alums are, and we have been working with them to provide an opportunity for them to help create this pipeline. So our alums, we've connected them uh, with the people who are interested in going to medical school, or they may pick a cohort of fifth graders that they want to follow. But we give them a toolkit that they can pull down online, which are different lectures, how to put on a health fair, how to help kids with a science project. And we have a coordinator who goes out and helps them launch their programs. We ask them to do at least six to eight programs a year with the kids. We evaluate, and those become the kids that we can recruit for our pipeline programs or our other opportunities. And as I share with your dean, I'll be happy to give them the two kid of the program too, because it really does give a way for your alumni to become engaged and to feel like they're doing more than just giving their financial resources, but they are actually able to help create this next generation of leaders. Maya Long. Um, I have a question. I know that you're special you're specialized in infertility. So how do you gain the tools in order to include the underserved to receive those special receive receive those specialized services. Well Mike will tell you one of the things that when you become president you actually don't practice medicine anymore. So I have to give that disclaimer. I used to be a great doctor. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that I have uh, had the fortune to do at because I was so passionate about women's health is to look for opportunities of how women could participate in a lot of the clinical research that we were doing about increasing fertility rates and then advocating for states covering fertility as a benefit in most insurance plans. And so when you look at what happened in Boston and in Massachusetts and some of the other states, there were several of us who advocated for women to have access to even simple infertility treatments because most of the reproductive disorders that women have are secondary to some underlying cause. So if you can get that covered by insurance, then a lot of times you can address their problem. So advocate, advocacy is the way to do it. Well, I think I'm going to have to cut the questions there. But I, once again, I really want to thank you, Dr. Montgomery Rice, for coming today and being our inaugural Ruth uh, Rothstein Memorial Lecture Series individual. I also want to 
present this small token again for us. And again, I want to thank you.